Over the past couple of days, we've been delving into the life of my mum, Wendy Watson. And in that house there is where the story all began. So come with me now as we take you back to the very beginning. So obviously we're back again to uh, discover more of the journey of, uh, of you, Mum. <laughs> and uh, do you know what? We, we've already covered so many different things. We've covered you sort of coming up with the concept of this, the operation in the first place, from sort of setting up the helpline, the gene pattern. We've talked about uh, life insurance and still we've barely sort of scratched the surface. <laughs> and I think yeah. where we've got to in, in sort of sharing this, this journey is probably around the, uh, the time that my journey started yes really yes so it was 2000 was it 2002 when we got the call to say that cousin helen was diagnosed with breast cancer yes it was early 2002 and um, <clears throat> this was a bit of a shock because she was only 29 she'd gone because she'd had her gene test when she was 21 and she was told that about 30 she needs to start looking at having screening or whatever so she went along for a mammogram at 29 and she was discovered to already have grade 3 aggressive breast cancer so of course she had to have a mastectomy and a lot of treatment she had another master double mastectomy as a prevention on the other one um, but it did have an impact on you because it brought your whole scenario forward much earlier so that's when you chose to go off and have your genetic test at age 22 um, you were positive and at 24 you were, at that time you were the youngest one to actually go through having the surgery mm. it's a crazy time that you know yeah it was i remember i remember exactly where i was when you rang to tell me that Helen had got breast cancer I was driving, you know where the Robin Hood pub is, uh, in Chesterfield, and I was coming back from, from work, yeah. and I just, I, I remember it, it was clear yeah, as anything. Yeah. And it was sort of like that, that moment of, crikey, you know, I want to make sure H is okay, I want to know Helen's okay. Yeah. But then that sort of realisation of, oh, mm, yeah. that, that, that means, you know, yeah. I need to go and get, get tested. Yeah, yeah. And then I made that uh, decision, obviously, um, and I remember saying it on air because I was on the radio at the time, I was on Peak FM at the time. Well, I don't know what happened actually, but I just know the next day there was like camera crews and everything everywhere. Mm. It wasn't there. It was like, what on earth is going yeah. on? And then the next minute, you know, I sort of had my genetic test and I'd made that decision to go and have the operation. Yeah. It's all right. You know, we, we're talking about this and, you know, it sort of goes from my perspective of, you know, how, how did you feel? You know, you were very young at the time, et cetera, et cetera. But how did you feel? Well, <laughs> difficult because, I mean, for me, um, that, to me, it was quite expected that I would have the gene fault. I thought that I would have. And for the people that had rung the helpline, I always put a very positive spin on it all and, you know, made people feel better. But a completely different thing when it's your own daughter yeah. that's telling you that she's got the gene fault. And that does upset you. It really does. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll find the same your same concern with Eva May, even though we know now that in actual fact, because of everything that's possible, actually having the gene fault, you can end up being more Gosh, protected yeah. Yeah, yeah. than the rest of the population because you can have a preventive double mastectomy with reconstruction, which I've battled to make sure was a good option for people. And so for Eva May, it won't be a disaster, no. but you will feel it. Of yeah, course you will. Of course, of course you will. Uh, one thing that people should never feel is guilt because you can't possibly know what genes you're going to pass on to your, your children. You, mm. you can't know that. And uh, the other alternative is, would you not want to have had you because I would pass you a faulty gene. Well, of course I would still want to have you. Mm. And, you know, you've been fine with having a faulty gene. Look at you now. I mean, you've had a much better result than you had before. Oh, 100%. Yeah. No, I thought, oh, yeah, okay. definitely. i never forget that. <laughs> Waking up from surgery and sort of like expecting yeah. to be looked like I've been run over by a, a bus <laughs> and then looking down going, whoa, wow, that, that, that was good. Do you know, <laughs> uh, actually, there was one thing that was very comical that, uh, I mean, even though you've got bandages and all sorts, I don't think there was anybody that didn't see them. The porters, any doctor, any nurse, passers by or anything as you were wheeled back on the trolley. Have a look at these. In, uh... 
it was. It was like for about two days, sort of, you know, a little bit like, oh, I've got, you know, coming round from all the anaesthetic and everything else. And obviously, I've got a film crew with me, yeah. you know, the, the majority of the time. And it was, it was literally just a case of like, everybody needs to see this. Everybody needs yeah, to see this. You've actually got a cleavage now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was like, whoa, I want, it, I want to go shopping now. Um, and I think, like, for, for, for me, you know, watching your experience and watching so many people gain from your experience, it was like a, a proper switch went off in me as soon as I came round from that surgery. And it was like, people need to see these. People need to see what yeah, yeah. the perception of a mastectomy is, yeah. you know. Yeah, and exactly. And yeah. I know that was a big drive for me in, like, sort of, you know, sort of getting on board with you and, and making people understand you know, sort of w what was possible. Yeah. Because I know with my own journey, I was desperate to see people's boobs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see know, what it could look like. To see what it could look yeah. like. And, and I struggled to find anybody that had had a similar surgery at my age. Mm. So, yeah, it was quite a, a poignant, poignant thing then. And, and, you know, when the documentary and everything came out, so it was obviously it was followed by The Tonight Show with Trevor McDonald, um, there, there was a whirlwind the yeah. whirlwind of stuff. Were you surprised by that? Because obviously there was a whirlwind around when when you made your decision. Yeah. And then there was a whirlwind around my decision. Were, were you expecting that? I wasn't at all surprised. I've got to say because it each time there's been a different phase. It's it's you know given it publicity, and the helpline just went crazy, absolutely crazy. <sighs> And in the end, what I found I was doing was arguing with doctors to get people referred, which was silly because what I was supposed to be there for was to just talk to people to help them to understand what it feels like, ask all the silly questions, if you like, that you couldn't particularly ask a, a, a medical professional. Um, and I was arguing with doctors to get people referred. Why? So, why, why? Why was there the argument to get people Well, because a lot of GPs didn't realise the risks. They didn't really Still know. At that point. They did Well, they didn't know the criteria for referral. So my next step was to get nice guidelines to look at it to issue criteria for referral. So there's no arguing. People can just be furnished straight away with the guidance. And so they can go to the GP and say, please, can you refer me for to the, my local genetic service, which I can always give to people. I, I know that. And, you know, because I fit in with the criteria. Right. So they, they didn't have to go to the doctor, get refused, come back to me. I have to ring the doctor up and all that, which was a waste of everybody's time when it could be resolved much more you know, equitably, right, you know? Right, I'm with you, yeah. I mean, because, I mean, I, I don't think I realised that, if I'm totally honest. I mean, I knew there were sort of some people that were, were struggling to, to get referred because they were, yeah, they didn't understand what their, their risks yeah. were, but I didn't understand, you know, the battle that you were having to go through with that. Um, crikey. So, you know, because there was a time, I remember coming back when the, when my documentary came out, right, I came back from work and you literally had two phones like this. <laughs> Right. Did, Someone came round, right, to come and see And you. I gave them the third one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you just 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 asked just to take messages and then they yeah. were making you a cup of tea rather than them you making them a cup of tea. Uh, you never it, met them it before. Was, it was yeah, that is true actually. It was that bonkers. is, yes, because we had three lines, didn't we? Yeah. We didn't you know, we had three physical telephones. Yeah. Um well, yeah, that was just silly. It's just crazy. It was silly. But I mean I've got to say, it it sparked the next phase. Of course it did. Which yeah. was great. So, uh, nice guidelines. Gareth was very keen to get them going, and there was one or two other people who were very keen. Which is Professor Evans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I became the patient rep on the nice guideline committee. And we got evidence-based, because it's all evidence-based, criteria for referral. And um, one of the things that came out of this in the priorities, key priorities for uh, adopting was um, that it was essential to have the contact and support and information and the support and contact with others who'd been through the same procedure. And that was number two in the key priorities. So, so the then... The then became a key priority. It did, yeah, absolutely. Nice guy, because... Though. It needed to be something governed. You could people could pick up the phone and talk to somebody else who'd had this done and so on, and that's quite reasonable. But it does need to be governed because you, you, people need to know that they can't put their just their own spin on it. It's got to be 
um, a balanced view. Yeah, because yeah, you've always said this with the helpline, is everybody needs all the information yeah. and then support no matter what their choice. That's, that, right. that's always sort of been the mantra of the yeah. helpline. Like you say, you know, yes, you can ring anybody and, and, yeah. and sort of speak to somebody that's had something done similar, but you can't be guaranteed that they're going to give them all the information that they need because that's just their viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I get that. So... So therefore, the helpline becoming a nice guideline and it becoming a priority, you would think would be helpful. Yes, except it wasn't. It wasn't. No, was it? not yeah, it wasn't exactly. in the lead. That was the kind of start of all the problems, if you like. Uh, I mean, I'm glad they did it because it still made it so that people can get their referrals and all the rest of it much, much easier. However, the Department of Health, where I'd had the grant from for the last 10 years, said, well, you know, really sorry, but uh, we gave you this grant as being a novel project. Now that you're a requirement of NICE, you're going to have to go to the primary care trusts, the PCTs, as they were called in those days, for funding, because we can't pretend you're a novel project anymore. We've, you, you know, 10 it. years, yeah, and, and NICE recognise you. So, of course, they go, I gung-ho go off to um, the PCTs and... Ask them for four hundred pounds each so for, for a, a PCT year. PCT is for each area. Just yeah. to, just to get that out there, so people you know so sort of know. That. Yeah. So it's like if you're talking about a PCT would be Derby, a PCT would be yeah yeah. There, yeah. there were there were there were hundred and fifty. Yeah. And I asked them all for four hundred pounds per, per annum, area annum, per, PCT, per, per annum. annum to cover the phone costs and some wages and or you know of or course, everything yeah, yeah, yeah. everything that you needed to do costs, and yeah. and obviously the expenses of training the support groups because we got the support groups going and everything then so and the awareness as well oh gosh yeah that, the, yeah, the, yeah lots the, of campaigns the big thing that people you know sort of don't realize and, and and understand is that hereditary breast cancer at this point and as well and and for the years before was not known about no. It was not known about. So no. any kind of awareness that was made was solely done by us. Well, yes. And it was. I mean, yes, OK, we, we, there's prevent and, you know, there's a, a lot of stuff that, that prevent do, which is amazing, and with Gareth. But our sole focus was raising awareness of family yeah. history. Yeah, it was, definitely. Um, and there's more to come on to that later yeah. on, and much more. However, so I sent these little small invoices out, £400 to each primary care trust. All the excuses that above half of them came up with for not paying um, was, were just phenomenal. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it became laughable, I, I, except I, I was very cross because I thought, you know, I, I'd given them evidence on how many people used the, the service, how needed it was and all the rest of it. And people just put so many brick walls in the way. And uh, what really put the tin lid on it was whole primary care trust saying they couldn't afford it and they'd already got a helpline. I said, oh, brilliant, if you've got a helpline, give me the number and I'll be able to pass anybody from your area. They've got a local number. Yeah. Well, they were telling fibs. And because I rang every day for this number that didn't exist. And eventually I was fobbed off onto a lovely old lady who ran a patient involvement group. And she said, well, that's typical of our PCT. Do you know they've just spent half a million pounds on a yacht? Oh, dear. So I said, what do they need a yacht for? Well, apparently, socially disadvantaged youngsters in the aim that if they went on this yacht, they could learn to value their lives better and that could impact on their health in the future. Right. There you go. So you can imagine my reaction to that. When you're only asking for £400? Yes. It wasn't even their sugar bill. <sighs> Nowhere near. So... I, this is like red rag to a ball. Well, it, it really though, was. It, it really yeah. was. It really was. So um, I wrote to uh, their, their MP, who happened to be the Secretary of State for Health at the time, and uh, then I we just said, well, it's up to each PCT how it spends its money on its local population. So it's not governed at all? No. I wrote to the uh, Care Quality Commission, same answer. It's up to each PCT how it spends its money on its local populations. Parliamentary ombudsman, exactly the same. So I thought, well, that's crackers. So I started to uh, look into how much they were paying themselves. Well, my eyes nearly jumped out of my head because, I mean, some of the salaries were just beyond belief. And when I found that one woman had paid herself £1.291 million bonus on her pension in one year, 
And this is out of the NHS pension, out of the, you know, our pension money. I thought, and, and that, you know, OK, she was the top of the list. Well, we did a spreadsheet and I really took the mickey out of it and I sent it to, uh, um, I forgot what his name is, through my MP anyway, to the secretary, um, Andrew somebody, Andrew Lansley, that's it. And eventually he uh, decided to uh, get the PCTs to cut their management costs by 30%. But anyway, they fiddled, anyway, can't really probably talk about that too much, but I've got the spreadsheet anyway. And uh, the figures didn't quite match up with the previous year, so I challenged that. Because and, at this uh, point, the <laughs> problem is with this point, is that it hadn't become about them not giving you money. It wasn't about that, it was about the injustice. And yeah. that, that's what, so, so it's a, okay. it, again, like when I say it's like red rag to a ball. It was, It's yeah. like, it's not just a case of you not wanting to fund this helpline, which we've, we've shown it is needed. You know, it, it'd take us something like 80,000 calls or something ridiculous. Oh, huge amount, yeah. And, and it, it then became about, well, as a population, yeah. this isn't good. And we were hearing them more stories about, you know, you sort of, they called it the postcode lottery, that if you're in a certain area, you could get this, and if you're in a certain area, you could get this. And it, everything just seemed to just be unfair then, didn't it? Well, I mean, what they said was, don't take calls from our area. I thought, well, as if I'm going to Is ask where they're from. Said? Oh, yeah, yeah. One or two said, said don't yeah, take that was calls actually from said. Area. Um, in the end, wow. I ended up, and I've got a massive load of Freedom of Information emails that I got from various different cancer networks, who are the people that advise the primary care trust. Because there were some PCTs that really did support me. Yeah, and yeah. one tipped me off and said, you know, there's an email going around the cancer networks about you. So I sent off under FOI. And I've never read such a load of rubbish in all my life. I mean, at that point, um, I mean, there's 276 pages of nasty, nasty emails about me at Yorkshire Cancer Network. Wow. 276 pages. Uh, it's just, just and ridiculous. You, you, did you confront that? Because this is, it just all seems a bit bonkers, you know. We've, we've followed this story so far, and we've followed this story of, of you know, you, you have changed medical history. You know, I know you're my mum, you know, and I yeah. could be slightly biased, but you have changed medical history. And then you're at this point in your life where the helpline that you founded was, then became a nice guideline, right? So it was needed. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's I know. literally needed. I know. To then people that are supposed to be supporting you. Yeah. Let me tell you the classic. You. Can I it's just tell you the absolute classic was, and um, I know I've got the piece of paper, I could show it to anybody, where it says, uh, this is Yorkshire, and it says, uh, it's not, it's most unhelpful that our lead clinical geneticist is such a strong supporter of the service. Now, how is that unhelpful? The only way that's unhelpful is if you've decided you're not going to pay. It all seems very crazy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, it's just, it takes your breath away. At the time, Andy Burnham, who was the health minister then, at that time, he'd used the helpline himself, and he'd be quite happy, he's done many interviews about he this, so I'm it. not uh, speaking out of turn or betraying confidences here. And um, they, one of them put, well, I don't care how many MPs' wives have used the service, we're not paying. <laughs> It's it's beyond. It's so beyond. what was what was brilliant was we came up with this idea to do. You and Paula came up with this idea to do a skydive to raise some money yes, for what so, the primary yes. care trusts didn't pay, fund. Exactly. So we'll get to that <laughs> um, because this is where we sort of like move into to, to that next part of of the fundraising and 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 how we had to tackle that. So I think we'll get to that in just a second. So. Uh, within the last episode, we, we started to touch and, uh, and quite uh, rapidly, actually, onto the funding issue. And we were talking about the fact, and you, you, you can see how passionate you are about it and, and how frustrated you are about it. So we were, we were talking about that, you know, the helpline had got to the point where it was a nice guideline. In fact, it was number two. Uh, in the priorities of, of yeah. a nice guideline. So, th so this service was recognised that it needed to happen. It needed to be there yeah. and it was immensely used. It's the only one of its kind. Yeah. There is no other. We know that or we knew that for a fact. But what the difficulty was was getting the PCTs to, to fund 
the helpline. And, uh, you know, we've, we've mentioned in the last episode, in quite um, a nasty way, actually. It was quite... It, it wasn't nice no. what was being done. No, and I, I remember quite clearly you coming to my house when I was in Wingerworth in Chesterfield and Dem. You were really upset. You were really upset because this was happening and you... I don't see you upset very often, right? Because it, it's not that I know with you, it, it's like a sign of not a sign of weakness, but it's you, you don't get upset, you challenge. Yes. And at that one point, you were upset, and that's well, when you I keep sort of went opening these envelopes where you said, I mean, I, when you could say it was my own fault for sending off because I know it's nasty about me. But why shouldn't I find yeah, out? Yeah, I why, need why to, know. You want to know. And I, I, to be honest, I was fascinated as well as upset. I mean, I thought it was, I, I didn't get it really. The only thing that I started to figure out was why? What is the reason? And they decided they didn't want to fund genetic services particularly. So I'm encouraging more people to go for testing earlier and, ha and spend NHS money if you like. Potentially, that's the only thing I could figure. Can't prove it, but that's what I figure is that I'm encouraging people to spend money now to save money in the future, obviously, save lives. But I thought that maybe I'm so active on this that they just wanted to, you know, silence me, didn't want me around really promoting something that was costing money. Oh, it's a guess, it's a guess. It's crazy, though. It's crazy. The thing is, you know, we, we can bang on about this for, for a long time and sort of, you mm. know, the whys and the, 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 the whatevers. But at the end of the day, this still wasn't funding your helpline. And, and I think for me, what I, what I noticed was um, it was just, it was a bit of panic as well in the, well, how am I going to keep doing this, yeah. knowing that it is saving lives, knowing that you've had countless people... Yeah ring you and say if it wasn't for you I wouldn't be here today oh, load, load. so you, in your head it was like well how do I keep this going because I'm yeah. still a I'm still yeah. a human yeah. that has to pay a mortgage that has to feed a family and has to survive yeah it's as simple as that so I remember sort of thinking mm. right I need to step in here as well you know I know what I'm capable of raising some money so we put the charity ball on that was the first thing that we did at Chatsworth. Um, and then, obviously, that sort of quickly um, sort of escalated. And, and I got the bug for it, to mm. be fair. I got the bug for, for, for raising money and for, yeah. for helping you out. And then we decided to do this skydive. <laughs> so th this idea came, right, that me and my friend Paulette were terrified of flying. We hated it. We hate flying pair of us. <laughs> so we thought, oh, I know, you know, what's, what's the best way to raise money is to jump out of a plane, jump out of something we hate. <laughs> Again... That kind of escalated from not well, just me and Paula. No, I, I, once you'd said that, and you're gonna, I thought, well, there's quite a few people actually wanted to do this and join you. And I thought, how about if each one of them jumped for a non-paying PCT so that and raised, that raised the their cost. 400 pounds? Well, the more I thought about it, th this amused me so much. Oh, you were, you were on it. I was really in my element. So everybody had a T-shirt that says jumping for Hull, jumping for Bromley. And I wrote up all the silly stories that each one of these, the excuses, it did, it, re it read like 40 Towers, honestly. <laughs> it was so funny because the excuses were just, well, they were mind-blowingly silly. But anyway, I <laughs> so... I actually sent a press release to each area and with a, a person that had used the helpline from that area yeah. so that they got the backup that it was used in that area and also the PCT excuse. So it got massive coverage all over the place and it was embargoed until the day of the skydive. And uh, uh, I had a, a, a contact in the Department of Health who told me how it had gone crackers. It, 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 the, there were phone calls all over the place, panicking about all this. Because um, I had a lot of support from the Department of Health. But yeah, they couldn't do anything. They were so we need to wonderful. Yeah. yeah, the Department of Health were wonderful. But it was because the PCTs could spend the money on their local populations how they thought fit. Anyway, so we did this skydive. It was an amazing day. Um, I remember Grant Anderson, uh, who's one of our trustees now, and his wife's been a, a big helpline supporter and user. 
uh, saying, never has so much been done, to misquote Winston Churchill, this is, never has so much been done for so many by so few. And uh, it is true, it is true. And it was, the atmosphere was electric. Yeah. It really was electric. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, there was a lot of TV publicity and everything about it's really, that. really emotional, and, about it. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was an emotional day, it was. actually. And we gave everybody a little uh, memento, a little um, keepsake thing, and said, you know, you can never know how much you've done for us, really. You never know how much this means. Anyway. I'll never forget jumping out of that horrible plane. I <laughs> But yeah, yeah I, I mean, did that's, it. yeah, it was it was a, a, a sort of an electric day. I mean, I I know I spent most of it sort of hiding, actually, mm. uh, not being able to face anybody because I couldn't stop crying because I was terrified. Yeah, I know. Um, so it's uh, it, so that happens, and it did have an impact, but it's still not enough. No, well, what happened? No, I mean, it, it covered so, some, not all, but it did co cover a bit of funding for that year. But obviously, this this now made me public enemy number one, with within that sector, the purse holders, because I mean I just didn't lie down. I I just fought you back. Didn't go away. Did I you? fought back and I exposed things, and also the Daily Express covered the story, and they covered the excuses and the yeah. yachts and all this sort of stuff. They covered all that. Mm. Didn't go down well, as you can imagine. Mm. And eventually, Andrew Lansley told the PCTs they'd got to cut their management costs by 30%. And, um, and do you but think that I, actually happened because of you? Well, put it like this. I don't know. I, I can't say. He didn't contact me, but he had the spreadsheet from me. Right. Uh, so via, my, via my MP. Right. And... Um, so, uh, and then it, it happened. One can only put two and two together and come up with what you think is the answer. Um, so, but the thing is that the following year, I looked and a lot of them had actually even increased their management costs. But what just, they'd put just, just... was that the previous year's management costs weren't the same as what they had been on the previous year's annual report because I'd done a spreadsheet, you see. Yeah, it's, it's all, it's all <laughs> so, a bit crazy. So there was a, I added it all up and there was £108 million worth of discrepancies. Right. So they actually said that it was because there was, I challenged one or two and they said, oh, it's because we've got different um, uh, in. Uh, information or different things we've got to use from directions from the Department of Health. So I wrote to the Department of Health and said, have you issued any change of direction for what should be managed, classed as management costs and what shouldn't? They said nothing since 2003. Yeah. I got that letter as well. Um, anyway, the next news is Andrew Lansley decided to abolish the PCTs because there was nothing anybody could do with them. Mm. They were out of control. Mm. So where did that leave you then? So this is what we've got to get to, yeah. you know, is, is the fact that yeah. the, the helpline was sort of highly affected by, you know, sort of sort of this, you know, what we thought would be a positive by it being a nice guideline was then sort of turned into a negative in a respect because yeah. you, you couldn't get any funding. But then obviously it did, it spurred the fundraising. Yeah. Yeah, and we went wholeheartedly into this. We then, uh, we got a logo, you know, thanks to the East Midlands Designer Outlet, they, they designed a mm. logo for the helpline. Um, at that point, we weren't a charity. We no. were still through um, Prevent, through what was the genesis appeal actually yeah. at the time. So we weren't actually a charity because in the past you'd had funding, yeah, right? Yeah. So when we were raising money, it was going to to Genesis, and then they would give you a, they would then give you a part of that, yeah. um, just to explain to people, you know, sort of how it how it worked. Yeah. So obviously, then we get to two thousand and eleven. 2011 is when you were... It's a little bit of... little bit. I need to fill in for you there. I was promised, uh, when w they looked at what was actually going to replace the primary care trusts, was the clinical commissioning groups. And they had a white paper, which they asked me to comment on. And I did a lot of work on that for them. And I was told that the helpline was going to be funded centrally. Because... So you were happy about this thing? Yeah, this was, this because... Was like, that, yeah, oh, goody, yeah. you know, and, thankfully. And Professor Sir Mike Richards, he was, he was expected to take over cancer because he was the head of the cancer network. And 
although he couldn't do anything with the cancer networks that were writing silly stuff about me, he actually did write to them. He was a very big supporter of mine. Yeah, very he was big. a lovely man, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. very nice, very good. Anyway, um, so I'm waiting for the PCTs to go and for us to be funded centrally. And suddenly, when this happened, the National Commissioning Board renamed itself as NHS England and said that they couldn't fund me. It was up to the clinical commissioning groups. So at this well, that point, was even just... crazier because there's 300 and something of those. So the thought of writing to 300 clinical commissioning groups for £150 and having to argue for that as well, I couldn't cope with that at all. That was just far too much to, to even contemplate back in the same cycle of of arguing yeah. all over again. I, you know, I, I wanted to run a helpline, not argue with people. Yeah. And the point of the matter is, is that you were asked to set this helpline up yeah. in the first place, you know. You, you'd had a, a, a general store and post office that you were running, do you know yeah. what I mean? You, you, you'd you had the farm, etc. So you, you committed your life to, to running this helpline Changed because everything. you were asked to, yeah. to do it. And now next minute, you know, this all this wonderful stuff that you seem to have done, didn't seem to matter no and that must have been frustrating because yeah. it's like well hang on a blooming minute yeah. you know you you've told me this xyz yet you don't want to back it and you put me in that situation it, it seems really unfair and like i say we sort of we're coming to sort of like you won tesco mum of the year i remember putting you in for that that was sort of around the 2000 an 11 time, in fact, it was 2011. Yeah. So people, you were being recognised for, for yeah. things that you'd done. You know, there was countless TV programmes, etc. Yeah. The Tesco Mum of the Year, that sort of enabled you to then start writing a book. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm Still Standing, that, that came out as well later on in that year. Um, at this point as well, there'd been countless sort of uh, fundraising thing. Aware it was more the awareness that we were doing more than yeah, anything else. Yeah. I mean, campaigns. we had teams going mm. out to mm. everywhere. Mm. I remember at one point, I was like, I did not... The, we, were, we were at three events in one weekend. Yeah, we had we the walk everywhere. in the park, all sorts of things, yeah. didn't we? we Just little, little bits and bobs of things all over the place. Because the point of the matter is, is that, you know, one in 200 people carry a faulty gene. And there were still people. It was like, I know with myself, you get to that point where if you miss somebody, you feel guilty. You mm. know what I mean? In a way, it's mm. like, well, I, you know, we haven't. You feel like, oh, God, if I'd just done more, yeah. we'd have got that person. Um, so, yeah, you, you'd, we had an amazing year in 2011. And then it seemed like you were still battling. You'd had yeah. the book and you were still battling. Yeah. So hence then the idea for the, the charity shops came and we were realising quite quickly that we needed to get charity status because the only way to keep this helpline going, to keep it funded, was to become a charity and that was the only way you were going to survive, yeah. was to raise money. Yeah. In order to get um, charity shops to have reduced rates and, and any, any other perks that you needed your own charitable status. So we decided to become our own registered charity. And uh, this happened in December 2012. We had our first charity shop actually opened in September 2012, but we got the charitable status in December. And that's really, uh, we thought this was going to be, um, you know, the start, a, a fresh start. Yeah. And things would, would look up and put an awful lot of money in into uh, getting these charity shops going. Because uh, the point is when you take these shops on, so like just, just sort of go, go back there, is that people were wanting to donate. They were wanting to donate clothes and, 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 and items and stuff like that. And we were sort of like, well, we don't really know what to do with it. So then the, the shops started. Now, I want to reiterate as well, when you went for charity status, was there ever a time when you were given a lesson? No. Were you ever sat down and said, here's your charitable status, this is what you have to do, you know what I mean? You have to do da, 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 da. yeah, otherwise you're going to be a massive bother. No, no, nothing like that. No. In fact, I didn't do the application. I had a solicitor in Bakewell do the application for charitable status. And, yeah. um, and, and you just think, well, it's fine because, you know... I that's know it. what that's my you know my, my yeah. role is yeah. to raise awareness and when it came to getting the shops, the big thing about the shops was being a central point for information. Mm. 
as well. So yeah. people could come in, they could pick up a leaflet, you know. But the big thing about the shops was the awareness on the high street. Well, that was the whole point, in, in, in my view. Um, I wasn't really bothered about having any wages or anything like that, and I certainly didn't take any. Uh, it needed an awful lot of money to be put in into actually, you know, you've got to buy shop fittings, you've got to yeah. set up and everything. There's, and a, a, there's a massive massive lot of expenses, vans, everything, loads of things that you've got to do, um, and staff that you've got to employ and so on. But I wasn't bothered about any wages, although the... Uh, the um, solicitor put a clause into the charitable status to say that one director can be paid right okay. which you know is not usual so but he says you know one director can be paid so i didn't bother about it for the first couple of years i certainly didn't draw any money because it was plowing it all back in we got more shops and one of my big things and i i've got a piece of paper that i wrote down and it put uh, that um for the first 10 years, I didn't expect that we would make any money, but I hoped within 10 years' time, it would be able to afford to fund somebody when I retire to run the helpline. But in the meantime, it would be an amazing awareness on the high street. Yeah, exactly, getting it out there. Because I remember we, we took a call, and it was a lady that had been travelling through Matlock, mm. and she saw the Matlock shop and went, yeah. whoa, because they were just going yeah. through that at the time. And, yeah. and they just saw Hereditary Breast Cancer Helpline. Yeah. And it spurred them to call you. Yeah. Really did. Yeah. And they were so grateful of that. And yeah. that was the effect. We've got, we've got people ring. We, we ended up with a couple of shops in London and people rang. They'd, they'd driven past and seen. You see, that was my whole point is people still didn't believe that breast cancer could be hereditary. Still at that point. Even still at that point. And particularly, uh, GPs didn't believe that the gene could come through the male line. That was a big, big, big that, Which is something we, 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 yeah. we did that later. But anyway, so that was, uh, you know, there was a lot of reasons, good reasons for putting, going for, for charity shops because you could have information centres in them. They would be frequented by all walks of life. Yeah. Uh, literally all walks of life. It's not restricted to any particular yeah. sect or anything like that. Yeah. Everybody can go to a charity shop and enjoy it. And people do like to go and have a browse, but if you've got the point, say people haven't got a lot of money, they probably don't have a terrific lot of knowledge. Some people may not know. And if it's there, then they can pick the leaflet up easier. Exactly. And it's yeah. as simple as a leaflet. That's all it you is, is, I mean? is, is get a leaflet, that. ring the helpline. Yeah. Breast cancer is, it, it can be hereditary in one in 200 people with the carrier faulty gene, that's it. Yeah, so it was, it, was, it was sort of really important to get that message onto the high street. That, was, that, was, that was the priority. Yeah. And, Always and, the priority. Yeah, of course. And then obviously it wasn't easy. No, and it, and it and it still hasn't been easy. Um, and it, you, what you would think should be um, supported, and what you think should be, you know, sort of a, a nice kind of relaxing, more of a relaxing time for you to just sort of do what you're supposed to be doing, which is answering the helpline, just kept coming with more battles. Yes, it did, and, uh, and uh, prior to well, that, prior to well. that. In September, uh, but just before I had um, uh, one of my first illnesses, um, the, the things were going a bit better. And uh, the accountant said, well, we could put you on the books and you could draw a salary if you want. Now, mostly I didn't actually have the salary. I paid the tax and insurance, but I didn't have the salary. But I was put on the books for a short while. And then in September 2015, I contracted Guillain-Barre syndrome, yeah. which is um, very rare, very unusual. One in 100,000 people get it. So, of course, that had to be me. Yeah. Uh, misdiagnosed a lot over this. Um, and they also discovered that I'd got a benign meningioma in my head, which they thought was the cause of the symptoms. But it, we knew it wasn't because it was old and hard and calcified. So I did persuade them. I'd looked all this up and I'd said, look, will you do a lumbar puncture? I think it's Guillain-Barre. I know it's rare, but please do a lumbar puncture. And they did after 48 hours, they did do that. And it was. 
Um, do, you, do, you know, do you understand what you're saying here? Because in a lot of people's lives, right, having Ion Barre, having a benign tumour would be the big thing that has happened in their life, right, that, that, that has been life-changing. You're just skirting over it. <laughs> you're saying it like, oh, yeah, at that point, I get Barre, I'm 100,000, you know. <laughs> They are big deals, Mum, you know. And when you were <laughs> when you were in with Guillaume Barre, I remember taking you to hospital because you were laid on the sofa and you were so poorly. And I'd taken you to the doctors and you didn't want to go because it was too painful for you. And I got you back home and I went, we've got to go to the hospital. And you didn't want to go because you just didn't like the idea of the car journey. So we ended up taking you to hospital and I, I, I told a fib. I'm not, I, I told her, I said, yes, she's got chest pains, just so I could get you seen quicker, right? Because the, the, the fear of you waiting in A&E for a certain amount of time was horrific. Yeah, I and couldn't you do it. Everything, so everything was... I, I hold my hands up and say, I told a little fib in that I said she'd got chest pains because I couldn't, like, sit there. Oh. And then you got seen. Yeah, I but, got seen, and uh, I'd say eventually after... A few more, you know. I, I, I mean, I've got all my, I've got tons of phones and yeah, iPads yeah. and oh, stuff God, like yeah, that, definitely. you know, to look everything up. And uh, I, I think I remember sort of leaving you that night with about four nurses that I knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and it was Gillenbare. Sadly, uh, I, I knew there were two different forms of treatment, and what I was having was called intravenous immunoglobulin, and I knew how they measured it out, and you went on your own weight and, you know, divided by so many. Because this is what you do, so you investigate. Uh, uh, absolutely. You have to know what's yeah. going off. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so but, you, you knew about... Yeah. yeah. So on the Sunday night, I'd gone into hospital on the Friday morning and on the Sunday night, early as a Monday morning, I suppose, they started the intravenous drip. And uh, it, this finished about nine o'clock in the morning. And I thought, gosh, this is going on a long time. Anyway, the next day, I'm... Um, Feeling a bit better actually, and uh, you were uh, in intensive care at that point. Oh God, yes, I was. Yeah. I was in, um, yeah. What do you call it? ICU. ICU. Yeah, yeah, one of those things. Anyway, the next day, uh, I said, "So, uh, what am I? Uh, you know, when do I have my next one?" And this uh, young lad said, "Oh, you're not having any more." I said, "What do you mean I'm not having any more?" And he says, "Oh, I'll uh, I'll get a nurse to come and talk to you." So I thought, oh, what's going on here? Mm. So I kept looking out for nurses, and there were no nurses. Then Professor Hajvasilu from Sheffield came, uh, and he's uh, the neurologist from Sheffield, and he comes twice a week to Chesterfield because they don't have a neurologist in Chesterfield. And there were no nurses, and I saw him at the central desk looking through my notes, and he came over, and he pushed and pulled, and he said, how do you feel, and one thing and another. So I said, yeah, can you tell me what happens next? And he said, oh, you have another, you know, you have one for the next four days. I said, I thought I did, but this young lad just said that I'm not having any more. And he said, oh, no, no, you next four days. I said, oh, well, that's confirmed it. The next news, I'm told I'm being moved out of the ward. And I said, well, why am I being moved? And she said, well, because you cope very well with it. And I said, well, oh, OK. So they trundled me with all this huge trolley with all these boxes of um, presumably the, you know, the immunoglobulin stuff. And uh, they trundled me to a, a ward right at the far end of the hospital. And the next night, nobody came and did my drip. And I thought, well, isn't somebody going to come? And they said, oh, well, because you had it early as a Monday morning, they'll do it in the morning, probably. So the following day, we, oh, well, they'll probably come and do it after breakfast. Yeah, it'll be probably after breakfast. Oh, well, they're doing showers now. And this went on, oh, you've got to go and have another scan. So I go off and have another scan. Then you came and then Eva May was on the bed and, you know, all these yeah. sort of things. Then the next night, I still didn't get another load of this stuff. I said, look, I need to see a doctor. I need to know what's going on here. And everybody just scarpered all the time. And none of the nurses knew anything about anything. Mm -hmm. And eventually, on the Wednesday morning, uh, a doctor came along and he said, um, I'm sorry to have to tell you, he said, but the reason you haven't had any more is because 
you had all the immunoglobulin in one go. By accident? And uh, I said, well, and he said, well, you know, the nurse just did it all. But we've checked with Sheffield and Sheffield say it's fine. And I, said, uh, I was that astounded because I was panicking because I was thinking that the reason they're not wasting any more money on immunoglobulin is this benign meningioma they've found through a scan is not a benign meningioma, it's something more serious. And I was kind of imagining that I was, you know, got something more serious wrong with me. Mm. And so when he came up and said, well, the reason you've not had any more is because you've already had it, I hadn't got the presence of mind to say, but who checked up with who in Sheffield? I just, I was just so taken aback. And I said, well, how do we know? Can I see the empty boxes? Well, they're in the hospital, Skip. I'll I tell you what, he said, I'll get the... Um, pharmacist to come and confirm with you well no pharmacist came but he did say to him he says now how's your spirometer chart I said well I haven't got a spirometer let alone a chart so he said well you know you need one of those we'll get that organized so I'm sort of left there waiting for this spirometer to check to see whether my well, it, it, the dangerous the, uh, this bit. Time you've got Guillain Barre. I've still got point. it. Yeah, yeah, I've still got it. So you have got talks uh, of a tumor, but you've still got this Guillain Barre, which. Yeah. It, 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 if you, it, let me just tell you this: that if you don't catch it in time, you end up having to go on a ventilator, because what it does, it attacks your nervous system from the extremities and it's it, so it starts off like mild pins and needles in your hands and feet until it till you start to get paralyzed in your legs and nothing really works you can't push very well and eventually it'll go to your pulmonary system your heart and your lungs and that's where it gets very serious and you need to be on a ventilator and that's why I needed a spirometer to keep checking that you were, could breathe yeah. fast enough you know strongly mm. enough so all day I'm waiting for this spirometer spirometer whatever it is and none appeared so and I thought oh this is bright this is anyway in the end I thought well I'll have to get one of those things that they use for um I forgot what they're called now but th that you use for if you've got asthma uh yeah like a, yeah an inhaler that yeah no not an inhaler you blow into it but oh yeah, yeah I can't think what it's called just off offhand at the moment but I thought well I said to a nurse I said can you get me one of those if you can't get a spirometer I'll download a chart on my phone, I'll download a chart, just get me one, because otherwise I'm going to put it on Facebook, because I'm bound to know somebody that's got asthma that's got one of these, because yeah. they're very common. Yeah. And uh, I got one straight away and I did my own chart. And I was in hospital for a couple of weeks. You were in hospital for a month. Was it a month? Yeah, you were in hospital was, actually, for a yeah, month because yeah. I remember I had to go down to London to do a, a talk for you as well. So you were in, you were in a long time and all this time as well. This benign tumour is, is here. It was on your frontal lobe. Yeah. Wasn't it? But and and I uh, and but I'd been reassured this was fine. Yeah. But I was still on the Friday night as I was due to be uh, released or whatever you call it, um, or discharged on the Monday. <laughs> A junior doctor came and he pulled the curtains round me quarter past five at night you'd done this big campaign which we'll talk about in a minute yeah the jeans don't care one pulled this curtain round and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said um uh have you got anybody you can contact well at that moment my heart went blah, 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 blah. and i said why he says well we've just had some results from your scan and i thought oh god it's this brain tumor thing and uh, I said, well, no, I haven't, because my daughter's doing this campaign, my husband's babysitting. No, I haven't. And you've already n already alarmed me, so you might as well just tell me. And he said, well, we've got the results from the MRI scan, and it looks like, although you've got a, uh, the meningioma, it looks like there's something else as well. We don't know. So I'm going to send you for a biopsy to Sheffield. And I thought, oh, good grief. Well, I'd just started to feel right. I'd just been outside, it'd been a nice day. I'd managed to get out of the wheelchair and walk for a little way, unaided, you know, about 10 steps outside. I was just, you know, really feeling happy. And this just hit me like a, a ton of bricks, it really did. And uh, they said that I could have somebody to chat to as much as I wanted. And I had a friend from Bridge came 
and we chatted through the night because it was just awful. Julian, one of our advisors, said that he could um, he'd come over and be with me. And Gareth said he'd look into it for me. And they both of them, you know, really pulled out all the stops to find out as much as possible. And it was decided that uh, when I was chatting, I thought, I just can't cope with going through any more of this sort of, um, you know, any more of these tests. And not knowing. I, I just can't cope with it. I need to get better from the Guillain Barre. I'd found in one of my um, papers that, uh, that we'd found that you could get a brain lesion from Guillain Barre, which will go in three months. So I came to a conclusion. I thought, right, I'm going to get well from the Guillain Barre. I'm not going for any more of you biopsies and stuff like that. I'm not going to do any more of that. I'm just going to I'm just going to get better, and then in three months' time, I'll I'll have another scan, and if it's gone, it's gone, and if it hasn't, then I'll tackle it. And we're back again, and it feels, Mum, like this journey sort of it, it's never ending, no, you know. And no. the, and on the last sort of episode that we we talked about, um, most of the episodes were ending, and we were sort of like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, that's amazing, and we feel like now it's sort of this is where things. I started to go wrong a bit, you know, and the, it was, we left that last episode a bit on a cliffhanger. If you were waiting to to hear if you had a brain tumor or yeah. whether 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 this brain tumor was going to kill you, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so we she get asked. to the <laughs> yeah. well, we get to the um, the weekend, and uh, they came round to take a blood sample ready for. Uh, ready for me having a biopsy and I said no I'm not having it and they said well you can't have your biopsy I said well exactly I'm not having it oh right okay so uh, they asked me if I would see um, this other doctor after the weekend um, while my consultant who was on holiday for three weeks unfortunately uh, the real consultant that should have been on um, was away and uh, so I got everybody in a room to try and explain what the situation was. I went back to the beginning of the story. I sat myself in the biggest chair, the big armchair, and I sat this doctor in a small, small chair, and I had Trudy with a, with a clipboard. I had Chris there. Uh, and Trudy's, Trudy's who works, works for the helpline. Yeah, the yeah, time, I, I had a, oh, taking notes. Right, because so I'm a, I've got to be in charge here. I've got to look after this. So I went back I to the beginning. I love the fact you just said you put yourself in a big chair. And I dogs, did. Like story time. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah, he was in the little chair. I put him <laughs> just there. He was a very affable gentleman. And I said, right, OK, we start off. First of all, I come into hospital. I'm told that my blood pressure, 220 over 150, don't count because obviously the blood pressure machine's wrong. Well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> right. First of all, and then I get overdosed. I, I get misdiagnosed. I get told I've got a brain tumor. Then I'm told it's not. It's not. It's nothing. It's old and hard and calcified. Doesn't count. I find out I've got Guillain Barre. I'm not told at all that I haven't got uh, that, that that I've had all of the um, immunoglobulin yeah. in one day. In fact, there weren't. Wasn't even on the notes to let the professor from Sheffield know. He was even in the dark about this. So I said it took two more days before I found out that it wasn't, you'd not stopped it because of the brain tumour or whatever. You'd stopped it because of, um, because I'd had all of the immunoglobulin. I've now gone through another two weeks or so of, you know, just checking and trying to get me with physio and get me mobilised again. And then on Friday night, just before all the doctors are going to go off for the weekend, I have somebody come. I said, I just want to put you in this situation. So just close your eyes, will you? So he closed his eyes and I said, right, OK. I'm just drawing the curtains round you. OK, now, have you got anybody you can contact? And he opened his eyes quickly and I said, how does that make you feel? And he said, well, yes, I, I see what you're saying. I said, look. I said, I've had somebody come and tell me how, you know, I need somebody with me for results that you're not going to tell me what they are. 
And this is at quarter past five on a Friday night and there's nobody over the weekend to explain what's going on or anything. It, that's no good to anybody. Luckily, I've got two professors that um, deal with neurology and things like that as well that advise me on the helpline. Uh, so I've had other people to talk to and I've been able to do more research. So I said, but I can't, I, I'm not doing any more of this. So he, he, he said, right, will you stay in hospital until Dr. Iqbal comes back from his ho holiday? Okay. And then we'll see. We'll have the results of your MRI from Sheffield, which we sent the MRI to Sheffield, not send you for a biopsy. So anyway, I did the same story exactly with Dr. Iqbal, but this was on my bed and he was a lovely guy, lovely. Mm. And I'd got all these sheets of paper set out around my bed like this and each piece of the story I got to, I got this piece of evidence <laughs> out and that piece of evidence. And we got to the bit where I said, now, can you close your eyes? And he said, oh God, he said, oh, I'm going to have to get you out of here. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> he said, look, he said, the results will be through to the MRI. He says, but... Let me reassure you, I am quite sure that there isn't a problem. Ugh. I am quite sure yeah, of that, yeah. but I will know very, very shortly. So I kind of felt a lot better then. But mm. you see, I'd got all this evidence, you see, about yeah, yeah. one in 10,000 people get um, a, a brain tumour. I, I have not had a cancer, so it can't be a secondary. Yeah, I've had yeah. all the parts of me removed. I've had several... Um, several scans, body scans that were all fine yeah, and this, that yeah, and the other. Yeah. So it was just too coincident. This was, this was all to sort of provide evidence that you did not need a, uh, uh, a biopsy. In my head. In your head. On so my head. You, you were just, you were that adamant that, yeah. that, that was this, not this, I'm not getting involved in this. I've got to get better from this and then we'll tackle this later. Anyway, he said, I don't think you're going to need to tackle that. But about 20 past two, he came in with such a flourish and he went like that on my bed with this sheet of fax paper that had just been sent through from uh, Sheffield. So I read it and uh, it said that, uh, I said, well, what does this actually mean? And he said, just read it. It says, benign meningioma, old, hard, calcified, not a cause of the symptoms. The symptoms are consistent with Guillain-Barre. This, this meningioma is harmless. Right? So Massive. Don't bother about it. Yes, massive sigh of relief. Finished. So, so we think. So yes. over the next few months, lots of physio, people coming to the house, showering me and all this. You did, nonsense. yeah, you did. You had to be showered. Oh, and yeah. And then, you? you know, milestone of being able to walk 100 yards and all this. Yeah. It went on and on and on. And uh, I got better over a period of a few months. And then I started to not feel so great, not so great, uh, again. And uh, I thought, well, it's my hips. I know I need new hips. And I started to be a bit more you know, bent over on one thing or another. Anyway, we you got... Were, you really did sort of go on the decline. Yeah, I did. Like that, I did, did yeah. yeah. Now, that was only very mild to start with. Very mild. Um, it just progressed. On Brexit Day, June the 23rd, we got a visit from the Charity Commission who were concerned that we didn't seem to be making an awful lot of money. And I said, well, it doesn't actually really matter because, you know, it's a 10-year plan, this is. We've started from zero. Mm. I said, yes, the first year we showed a loss, but the last year's book showed a small profit, which isn't... which is Unheard of for a business. Uh, uh, absolutely, don't expect it for two, three, four, five years even to, to be making a profit. But anyway, they seemed to be concerned. And they were picking up on all sorts of little things like, for example, I was the only signatory on the bank account, which had been since 1996, because yeah. it had only been me. I never thought that I needed to get more signatories on. I was, oh, that's dead easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soon put them on, and before even the Charity Commission would have got themselves back to Liverpool, there were three more signatories on the bank account. Simple as that. bear in mind, again, we, we rewind to sort of parts before where we said about you going for charitable status, the solicitor sorted it all out. The reason yeah. you went for charitable status was because you needed to, to raise money to be able to sort these exactly. shops out to be able to keep the helpline going. Because exactly. otherwise, 
it wasn't going to happen. No. So nothing was ever. You were never given lessons. You're never given any training. You're never given. You know what I mean? I'd just carry on running the helpline and doing it. Yeah, and and doing and setting the shops up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we get to uh, you know. They said, "Well, you're not me." And I said, "Look, seriously, it doesn't matter. I've hardly been paid anything over the last few years." And this. Well, you shouldn't be paid at all. I said, why? And they said, because you're a trustee. I said, oh, well, I didn't know. I said, I thought there was something in the in the governing document, which I didn't know where that was, actually, if I'm honest. I didn't even know where it was. But I said, uh, I'm sure the solicitor wrote something in that allowed that. I said, oh, no, you can't be paid because you're a trustee. So I said, well, I haven't been paid for since well before, I've hardly been paid at all, and definitely not since I had the Gillon Barre, which was nine months ago. Yeah. Not been paid anything. In fact, I've got my P45 because I've given up on getting paid. Yeah. So I've got my P45. And um, anyway, so they said, well, we'll be in touch with an action plan. They, they tried to find fault with everything they possibly could. And, um, and, I, and I understand that because I probably, you know, there were probably things that weren't correct. I mean, we didn't hold a lot of meetings together. We had an AGM each year, but we had a lot of contact by email and I had daily, if not weekly, phone calls with Gareth over all the cases. Yeah, and he was one of the trustees. So we, were, we had a lot, of, a lot of contact, but we didn't hold monthly meetings or anything like that we had an AGM every year that where we did all meet and then we had just everything was done by correspondence by email but again it's like the, these aren't things that you should should know about straight away yeah. do you know what I mean I mean to some people it might be like well you know it, it's sort of it's, it's common knowledge is it is it common knowledge? <laughs> yeah. Or do you just want to go and do something? Want to get on with it. To and, get on with uh, yeah, it. And, and, and the, the point's always been with you and it's, it's a frustration and it's hard because in my head I've always had sort of like, well, what happened? What if something was to happen to mum? And that was where, you know, when you got your Guillaume Barre and everything else, it, it was again, it was a, a big sort of, you know, crikey. It, you know, I'm not just going to mm. lose, you could lose my mum. There's, there's this fortress of a of a thing that yeah. needs to continue. Yeah, exactly. And the only mm. person that has everything in here is you, mm. you know? And you say yourself, it, it's difficult because you've spent your life building this in here. Yeah. So how do you give it to somebody else? Yes, you know? and, and that's something that needs... It needs to be taken over over a gradual period of time. Yeah, of and course. I recognise that. And that's why I gave this 10-year plan for the charity shops to cement themselves yeah. in as many places as possible, you know, for the awareness side of things, and to be make it a sound charity in 10 years' time to be able to support more people. Because I didn't expect anybody. I was answering the phone at that point 24 hours a day. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. And a lot of your calls came at night time. They did. Because yeah. I always I, I explain this to people in that when you have a gene, you're not poorly. So you can't be off work. No. You know, it's not a case of That's I'm, right. yeah. I've got to, you know, sort of look after myself and stay off yeah. work. So you're at work and your day to day is going, so your brain goes in the middle of the night. Yeah. And that's when a lot of the calls were coming. Yeah. As well as you're running the shops. Yeah. As well as trying to create the awareness. As well as you know, looking after a granddaughter. Yeah, I well, want exactly. to spend time yeah, with her. Uh, you absolutely. Know, yeah. it, it, it's hard. Yeah. So anyway, so just to, to continue, because I wanted to get that across, that these are all these things that are happening. And you've got the Charity Commission coming in, and instead of, this is what frustrated me, is instead of helping you and guiding you, they were telling you off. Yeah, I mean, you see, I, I can't. This is one thing that needs sorting out because they are, uh, uh, they can't be both an advocate and a regulator. They're, they're ad, you know, uh, regulating you or they're, they're advising you. They, they can't, you know, if if you ask them something, they suddenly become a regulator and jump on you. Whereas instead of being an advisory, you know what I mean? It, yeah. Somehow it needs to be split. That's I how think. You felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's beside the point. So we get to. I'm waiting for some correspondence because they said they were going to send an action plan. And it wasn't until after the August bank holiday did I receive a, an email from them with this action plan and wanting a further meeting. Well, I think most of the things that were on the action plan had already been 
uh, sorted out. Mm. Um, we had a, I got, to, they told me that uh, we needed to uh, tell them, ask them permission if I wanted to be re-employed or whatever, that needed to have permission through them. Um, we got a meeting sorted out uh, with a new chair of trustees and director uh, and other things like that. And we got this sorted out for the 7th of October. They decided they would come back on the 18th of October to see how we were going on with this action plan. So uh, we, this happened. Um, we had the meeting on the 7th of October. I resigned as, 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 a, as the chair and as a trustee and everything. And the plan was that they would ask permission for me to be employed on the 18th, mm -hmm. which we minuted and we've got this more organised now, you know, yeah, yeah. we've got proper minutes and all this sort of stuff instead of emails. Yeah, yeah, so we, you know, we did it all properly and bullet pointed and all the rest of it. So they came along on the 18th of, uh, of October and uh, we got all the books and records which they wanted to look at. Well, we showed them all that, you know, everything was there for them to see. And uh, they brought along with them a really nice chap, um, Alan Rawlins. He was the accountant. And after they'd finished, I said to him, I said, you know, is everything all right? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, I wish all charities were as easy to deal with yeah. as, you, as you've been, you know. And uh, Jackie said, do you think you'll need to come again? And he said, oh, definitely not. He said, we've got plenty more charities to, uh, to look into. Uh, one of the things that we said to them while they were there is that, I'd, that we showed them the minutes that I'd resigned as a chair, yeah. as director and trustee, uh, chair of trustees, and uh, that, that we had a further meeting booked for the 7th of November to discuss my position and role within the charity. And all three of those... Um, Charity pe Commission people just said, oh, right, yeah, you know, they nodded yeah. and agreed, yeah, fine, you know. So everything was fine? As far as, uh, as, far as I was concerned, we told them, they'd nodded an, an, an agreement, all that's all good, do you need to come again? No, everything's fine and all the rest of it. We didn't get any... Uh, uh, one thing that did come out of it, and uh, we discussed the actual money that was costing the uh, the charity to run the shops, and I said, well... Really, they are essentially there as information centres, and this has been my 10-year plan, to be information centres, self-supporting information centres, yeah. and awareness on the high street. And Alan Rawlins suggested that um, we did an audit of the leaflets, say at the beginning of a month, and then see how many had gone at the end of the next month. And I thought that was a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. and I implemented that in November, and we could see which shops were actually you know, the most leaflets were being uh, given mm. out from uh, or help, you know, help themselves or whatever, uh, which was really good. I felt quite upbeat. We had the uh, meeting on the 7th of November. Uh, I was sent out of the room and um, I was asked to attend, you know, but I was sent out of the room. They discussed my position. They offered me the role of operations manager on £25,000 a year with a bonus if there's sufficient funds and I said yeah that's absolutely fine no problem at all with that or 24,000 sorry and so that's what happened and uh, three months later we get and I don't really know how this actually came about but we got um, uh, some communication from them to say I shouldn't have been re-employed uh, this wasn't allowed, we hadn't officially asked or some such thing like that. Although I don't know the wording of this because bear in mind I'm not a trustee at this point. So I don't get this correspondence, I don't get to see it and I don't really get much out of it because I'm there as the puppet to do what I'm told by the new board, you mm. see. So And all of this time... And all this time I'm, I'm actually not very well, not very well at all. So we come back to another episode and again we were sort of left on a bit of a, a cliffhanger with the, the, the last piece and, you know, as we've said, the, the, the thing about what we're doing here right now is we've never done this before. I've never actually interviewed you. No. Yeah, and we've never really spoken out about, about this. 
um, as much as you, we've wanted to and 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 and, and have tried. Um, this was a, a a time in in our lives really that was very very difficult because Joy, you were going through all of this stuff with the the, the charity commission and the, and the charity and then it's taken out of your hands and you know there's this battles going on and all the time you're getting poorlier and poorlier and you know your your movement was so restricted mm. yeah and we just constantly kept thinking you needed a new hip you needed a new hip do you know what i mean it was mm. the guillaume bar it was that effect um and with the the sort of the, the the charity commission stuff and and the you know you're still running the shops you're still running the helpline you're still being a grandmother yeah. you're still being poorly everything then is taken out of your hands so you don't know what's going on so no. this thing that we've talked about over all of these past episodes, this thing that you've built up, fought for, saved lives with, yeah, fought again for to keep going because you know it helps, you know it saves mm. life, you're getting told this constantly by people. It's now taken out of your hands and you're being still being told that it's being done wrong, but then it's still on your head. Yes. So... It's hard, that. Yeah, it, it was. It was difficult. Um... Not knowing what was going on was probably the most difficult thing for me because I like to be... In control. Uh, yeah, I, I think I've always been in control of my own destiny. Um, I'm not saying that I don't work work together with people, because I, I do, you know. I mean, i always liaised with Gareth and everybody and been a good committee member, I hope, but I, I, I've always known what was going on and that was the problem, that I didn't know what was happening. But instrumentally, right, is that it's okay that these, you know, that, that you had these team members, but realistically, the be all and end all of it came down to you. Oh God, I've, I've, everything. But you weren't, but you weren't allowed to to do that. But it no. still came down to you. No, this is what seems bizarre. Yeah, you know? yeah. There was a, there's a, there is an interesting, funny story actually. Uh, in <laughs> November, um, in November, and I don't actually mind this being uh, this being. Uh, uh, aired because it's it is an interesting story. Uh, we got an offer of some free uh, solicitor advice, a free meeting with somebody who apparently uh, advises the charity commission on compliance. I've got the emails about it, and uh, anyway, it was arranged for the only day that I couldn't make because I've got I was chair of Chesterfield Bridge Club, and um, at the time, and it was our annual uh, Christmas lunch, so I couldn't go. And uh, afterwards I said, how did you go on, what happened? And they said, oh, very thorough, very thorough, but nobody told me what actually had been talked about. And in January, uh, this was in November, and in January I get a bill for £900 for this free meeting, <laughs> which I couldn't quite uh, get my head around. And I said, hang on a minute, this is free. But of course I went a bit slightly bonkers because it's still down to me to make sure that the charity's it. got enough money to pay all these things and I'm the one that's making sure of this all the time. Anyway... And uh, you ploughed everything into it Oh, God, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we certainly had. Anyway, so we get to February and the Charity Commission said, oh, no, you know, you, you, you can't be re-employed, you haven't applied or done properly or whatever uh, so although they, you'd had the meeting to say yeah that and we'd, and we'd ask the question in fact it wasn't me that asked it was the new chair of trustees john Pittman. he asked and uh, well he didn't ask he just said we've got a meeting you know to discuss wendy's position you know yeah, on the yeah, yeah. 7th of november is that you know yeah fine good and that's and that was that was it she's no longer a trustee she's no longer a director anyway so we uh uh, the next news, I'm um, contacted by uh, the secretary of the uh, of the board, uh, who says uh, we've had a communication from the charity commission and they're going to issue a warning. And I thought, well, what for? Apparently, for me being re-employed, I, I think, or we hadn't fully complied. I don't know. You said I didn't see it, but we hadn't fully complied with the action plan or something like that which I was a bit mystified over. I didn't think to say, where are the minutes? Because we hadn't had any minutes from them at that point. Because bear in mind, now I'm feeling more and more ill. More and more ill. And you could see it. Yeah. We could, we could see it and it was, we didn't know why, 
Yeah, we didn't think that it was to do with your head. No, we just course. thought that you were being hammered. Yeah. And we could see it was horrible, Mum. Because we, we could see you getting depressed. Well, and you're not depressed. No, no, I, I couldn't cope with anything, really. I didn't... Oof. Anyway, this, this warning, I thought, oh, what, what, what about warning? What about... I've got Olive's in a... In a His grandma. Yeah, in, in a home. She'd been... Sec no, she hadn't been sectioned, but she'd been sent to a, you know, a, that type of ward that... Uh, Let's that just to explain, it's because grandma dementia. So had dementia. Mm. Uh, you know, there's all these things going on and... Uh, oh, Horrible time of my life, really. We lost anyway, Grandad as well. Anyway, we had lost Grandad, yes. We lost him in the January as well. Yeah. So we... Uh, 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 we, we I, I think they appealed this warning. But again, I wasn't part of the, the, the committee, if you like, because it was through the tr Board of Trustees. I wasn't involved in any of this. Yeah. And oh, these board of trustees, you've got to, again, it sort of explain that they were made up of, of people that, you know, as is all trustees, that are sort of, you know, friends that are, are believers in what you, you're yeah. doing, you know, they want not... to support you, etc. Mm. But they're not there to run a charity, you know what I mean? Or, uh, not... They can't do everything. Of course they can't. And they can't know everything, even yeah. if you, you know, I mean, if you gave them an induction course that lasted two years, they'd struggle to know everything. <laughs> Because yeah. there was a lot, there's a lot of history behind it all. I mean, they, you know, they were always kept informed of everything, and they did run it because I was kept out of all of this. I just kept running the helpline and kept, you know, making sure there was enough money and stuff to to keep going, keep paying the bills and yeah. all the rest of it. Anyway, in the warning came, and it got very little amount of. Publicity initially, just something in, I think it was called civil society or something, but something and nothing. And we just thought, oh, that's good. And then I got a letter, as did all the trustees. And well, anybody, you're not a trustee at this point. No, I'm not. But all the <laughs> other trustees and people who had been trustees or had been involved got a letter from, uh, uh, from a, a major TV company. Yeah. And that is where and at this point what was so difficult is you were getting so poorly mm. and you were exasperated and you could see it was just like and it what was hard for us again looking on because you are this pioneer and you are this yeah. person that has control of everything or lack or you know now lack of control of it because you're not allowed we didn't know what to do we did not know what to do because we we didn't we don't know no do you know what I mean and and so the the answer to everything as far as I was concerned was just well mum has mum set this helpline up you know what I mean she was asked to and and you know yeah. we, we just, what have I done it, wrong all it is is a fight <laughs> fight 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 yeah. to keep going yeah why to save lives and then boom mm. something else hits us again. And at that point, that was horrific. That really was. And, and you're so poorly at this point. Yeah, uh, and uh, reading this letter, the accusations were just dreadful. Mind boggling as they well. Were, they were dreadful. I mean, to the point where there was one of them, which was manifestly wrong, um, which, in a way, I should have just let her carry on with that then. I could, have, I could have had my own field day about that after. Because uh, in the letter it said that uh, we owned our London shop and were paying rent to ourselves. Really? If I could afford to own a London shop, I could afford not to bother with anything, yeah, couldn't yeah. we? You know, it was just silly. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, sadly, I was too stupid and I made the mistake of telling them that they got it wrong. I should have let them run with it. And then therefore... I could have really... I could, you know, I could have scotched the whole lot then, yeah, couldn't I? Yeah, yeah. So, a, uh, August the 14th, it went out on every channel that you could imagine because they sent press releases to all the channels, newspapers, 
I woke up that morning to uh, reporters at my door. Abuse? Absolute abuse. Online abuse like you've never seen. Trolling like awful. It was disgusting awful. actually. It, it, it actually was. Um, but again, I, uh, I'm in the Today programme where I'd always been their little heroine. Uh, they rang me, wanted, you know, to know my attack, view, attack, attack on attack, this. Attack. Yeah, uh, it was all attack. The whole thing was attack. And it makes you wonder, it's like, how can you go, and I keep pointing this over there, but it's, how can you go from this, this, mm. this, this, mm. this, this, this? To the worst person to in the, the world. the worst person in the world. Yeah. It just... It, it was mind-bogglingly sort of horrific. Yeah, it was awful. And the point was, it was the, the, the statement at one point was, uh, helpline founder pays herself £35,000 or something like that. That's one of the... That even was the case. So what? <laughs> yeah, uh, £35,000 over from 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Mm, I think yeah. it's about two pence an hour. Yeah. After a bit lower than minimum and, wage, I'd have thought. And what is so frustrating as well is it was never mentioned about how much you'd put in. Oh, no. No, no it never touched no, uh, on that. Although that was used against me. They said that I'd put the charity at risk by and loaning it, it money. money without without uh, a contract in place to say when they'd got to pay it back by. I hadn't put a contract in place to save the charity any pressure of having to think, oh, we've got to pay her back this amount of money before this particular time. And it was interest free. Let me just add, they said that I was putting the beneficiaries at risk. Well, what a load of rubbish. Do you know what? If I hadn't have done that and kept it going, there would be no beneficiaries to be at risk because half of them would be dead. It's as simple as that. I'm sorry, I feel uh, quite passionate about this because, of course you, do. Uh, you know, now, I mean, at the time, I wasn't, I you couldn't. You were so yeah. I got badgered, I got through the day, I did the interviews, one after the other, one after the other. I kept saying, you know, the only thing I've probably done wrong is I've listened to the accountant and the solicitor. And I, I mean, because I didn't know what else to say. Really. Well, I know, and you were tired and you were exasperated. And the point of the matter is you employ these people to do these things because you don't know, it, it, it's not your thing to do. Yeah. Like, you know, we were saying this the other day, like when you have a business, you employ somebody to do the admin side of stuff because it's not your strength. Yeah. Or you, you know what I mean? You know what, you're there to run a helpline. Yeah. To create awareness. Unfortunately, all this other stuff you've had to do. Mm. You've had to because... That's the only way to keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it wasn't that. Now don't get me wrong. We must say as well that there were thousands and thousands of people out there that had your back. Oh god, that were yeah. behind you. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens is is that the one the one to a hundred is always the one that gets remembered. Mm. This is the problem that you know. You can have one troll or one whatever, uh, you know, it's, that, that just says something nasty. And you get some that just like to jump on the bandwagon. And of course. Um, we've, all, we've all been there. We've, you know, it's just really, horror, really it? unpleasant and, and unfair. And, and yes, bless them, all the people that had used the helpline were outraged. They were What's absolutely there? incensed. But actually their stories never got told on they the... They never got told. No, that they... was rather a shame because they did write in. I do believe they did write they in. Did. In fact, I know they did. Yeah, I do. And, um, and there was... It, it, they, they just weren't aired. They just weren't aired. The point, oh gosh, it is. It's like hard, it makes me feel sick even thinking. I, I, I must admit, time. I don't really like going over no, this now I because it was such but, a it awful, feel sick. awful time of my life. Do you know what? I would tell you this as well. The day before, the, or two days before the publicity was coming out, I went to Sue, one of the helpline users, who was always called me her guardian angel. I went to her wedding in London, and um, I don't know if I can tell you this without crying, actually. Yeah, um, but I. Almost hope that I'd get wiped up on the motorway. I'd, I'd never commit suicide, I could tell you that. <sighs> never. Sorry. No, it's fine. I think it's so important for people to see this, you know, and to know the... Anyway, 
the so let's, carry let's carry on. Let's carry on. Yeah, let's carry on. But, <laughs> let's carry on. Right, I'm this, okay again. This now. is the point, and and that happens. And what happened then was it, 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 the problem was with that is that you know we were in a position. You know, I was working for the helpline as well then, and um, you know we, we were doing so well mm. with fundraising, getting the awareness out there. Mm. We've done the Jeanstone mm. County Wear campaign, and we've done mm. Louise's Legacy as well. Yeah. We've got the caravan. we've yeah. done so much. And then it was just a constant fight. Yeah, well, everything just fell down around our ears. It did. All the things that we'd got lined up. I know you've got a charity that got us, that was setting up and we were going to be their main charity and all sorts of things. They just pulled the plug on us because of the bad publicity. One bit. And that's what was so frustrating. Because, again, we go to all of this. All of this. Yeah, all this wonderful stuff. Yeah. One bit has that effect. Yeah. Do you know what that... Right, is that you, you know, it it was awful and it was a horrific time. And again, I think, you know, we, we've, we've talked about that now and we know the repercussions of that. Um, and then, of course, you, you go and have your scans. Yeah, so, yeah, because, because I'd already been diagnosed with a benign meningioma, you have to go and be scanned every year to make sure that it stays as a benign meningioma. So I kept putting it off because of everything that was going on and I really, you know, I've got this hip, I can't stand up, I can't do this and all the rest of it. I'd forgotten how to stand up from sitting out of a chair. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I had to have two people to pull me up from a chair if I hadn't got arms that I could push on. It was just silly. But anyway, I went and had the scan and the following day I had a phone call from uh, the uh, uh, Hallamshire Hospital neurology team and they said, uh, we need you to come into clinic tomorrow. And I said, uh, well, I'm a bit busy tomorrow. And they said, no, we need you to come in. Ugh. And I thought, oh dear. And I said, well, okay, yeah, I'll come in. And when I got there, they were lovely, but they said this uh, benign meningioma that you'd got, it's grown from being this big to that big. I've got a photograph of the scan. It had grown out of all proportion to nine centimetres. Now that's bigger than a cricket ball. A cricket ball is something like about eight, I think. So uh, anyway, and they said, "Well, we're going to have to remove it." And I said, "Oh, oh, right." I said, "Well, can't you laser it or something like that?" And he said, "No, it's too big." So I said, "Right, okay. How do you do it then? What happens?" And he said, "Well, it was very matter of fact about this lovely guy, really nice." And uh, Mr. Zaki, his name was, I adore him, absolutely adore him. He said, well, what we do, we shave you across there like that. And then he said, we pull that down, we pull that back. Then we chop the top of your head off <laughs> like that. We put that down there, we take it out and then we stick you back together again. <laughs> I said, oh, well, that's fine then. If that's all it is, that's, that's grand. Yeah. Let's get on with it. Again, <laughs> let's enjoy yeah, ourselves. Let's, let's just, just, again, okay, don't, again, this is just, you know, that like, this is just, again, another scenario. And mum, the, the point is, is that, one of these things happens in people's lives. <laughs> not One. Not the whole blooming lot. <laughs> so, you know, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, and all this time this tumour's getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And that... There's an interesting element to that, which we'd never be able to prove, but what is the link between the overdose of immunoglobulin and the tumour that was benign and had been there for 30, 40 years, old and hard and calcified, suddenly getting a new lease of life and growing all this extra material. And we couldn't possibly do it, possibly prove anything one way or the other because I'd be a research group of one because how many people have got a benign, a benign tumour that's been there for years, uh, got guillain barre and been overdosed with immunoglobulin? Me. That's probably it. I did ask the question of Mr Zaki, I said, because he said it had got a new blood supply. And I said, could you tell the difference between the original old hard calcified meningioma and the new, and the new one, you know, the new material? And mm. he said, oh, 100%. It was different material. Mum, <laughs> I feel like, you know, this is coming <laughs> towards the end of, of these series of interviews and it's been a roller coaster, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not over yet. I know. So we get to the point now where you 
Um, I've been to see the doctor and he's told you, you know, that this tumour, this benign tumour that was calcified that we thought wasn't doing anything had in fact grown. Yeah. And it had grown massively. Mm. Now, we need to explain that with these kind of tumours, it doesn't mean they're cancerous, does it? No, no, it? not at all. Not yeah. at all. Yeah, so uh, my appointment was for <clears throat> uh, April the 23rd, 2018, this is. And this was to have this nine centimetre tumour removed. removed. Yeah. And we found out this tumour was on your frontal lobe, is that right? Yeah, which affects, which affects your mobility. Uh, other things as well, you, you know, you struggle with a lot of things, but it's, that's what was causing a lot of the mobility issues. This being, not being able to stand up straight, this not being able to... You couldn't to... stand up from a chair. No, I couldn't. Couldn't do it. Impossible. No, I, to, I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. Forgotten. Um, so that morning, well, I was absolutely terrified. Uh, I remember oh, being dropped off at 7 o'clock in the morning, not sure whether I was going to live or die or what I was going to do, you know, well... This was performed and, you know, kind of real panic grips you. Um, but it's just sort of, a, there's also a bit of calm about it that you've got to go through with it. And there's nothing you can no, do. No, you just have to you can't, you go can't, with it. And for the first time in your life, you can't take control and change no, no, this. This is what it is. You have to do that. Yeah. Um, I was reassured that it, it was what's where it was situated was between these jurors that so it was relatively safe non-invasive into the brain itself but it was massive so anyway i uh, went through the surgery it was eight and a half hours long surgery I it came. was really long so let me just put this into context we're at home waiting for you <laughs> You go down the sort of first thing in the morning and we're kind of expecting you to be uh, back on the ward probably about one, two o'clock. Mm. Oh, no. No, it was around about eight o'clock, wasn't it? Something yeah. like that. It was about, I think it was about seven o'clock at night when we finally managed to, to get through and to hear that you were I'd, I'd back lived. on the ward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there survived. were some anxious yeah. people there. Yeah. It, they couldn't get over how huge it actually was. Every time, uh, you know, every time they talked about it, you know, Wendy Watson, absolutely huge, you know, meningoma and all this stuff. So anyway, that was, uh, that was, uh, I was such a relief to get that out, I tell you. And uh, the only thing was that because this was so big, my brain had been squashed so much and it started to, get back and expand back into the space. Mm. And I was in hospital for a week and I had a total of six and a half hours sleep in that whole week. You were, you were literally, it was, I remember speaking to you on the phone a little bit later that night. I don't know, I don't think we spoke, I know you text or something. Mm. There was a communication. Mm. And then the next day, we'd, you'd gone from being depressed. Yeah. You know, not yeah. seeming to care really, um, but yeah. just, just. I was just, I just, yeah. And then the next day, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was alive. I was doing all sorts of things. I, I, I think I'd gone slightly mental as well because they, <laughs> they give you these steroids, dexamethasone, I think it's called. And it does give you a little bit of hallucinations, but I mean, it it, it was crackers. But the but fact that it, though, I did, it? yeah, <laughs> I felt wonderful. I drank sixteen liters of water in the first day. They couldn't believe it. They sat underneath my catheter, just emptying the bucket all the time. <laughs> oh, well, game. But anyway, I mean, it, it was it it was quite funny actually. I mean, I actually you felt were hysterical. Oh yeah, I felt better than I'd felt for years. And well, I thought, <laughs> oh, I thought that you thought you'd regressed. <laughs> so, anyway, I mean, I could, that, the problem not being able to sleep was the fact that it, I couldn't switch my brain off. It wouldn't go to bed. It was like a naughty two-year-old. It really was. It just would not go to sleep. And it was, um, I don't know if you've kind of been to the pictures and you see the trailers and it's a pow, pow, pow. And that's what it was. All these memories were just jumping really? out at me. Very weird memories as well. Things back from my childhood and all sorts of things. things that yeah. you just wouldn't... Think, why would why you have thought you about that? that? Yeah, I remember going into the doctor's surgery when I was about 
four and I could remember what colour his shirt was. You know, stupid things, really remembering the strangest things. And in the end, I had to go to the doctors and say, look, you'll have to please give me some tamazepam or something like that because I have got to sleep. I can't carry on after three weeks not sleeping. I just can't do it. It's, yeah. it's just ridiculous. I don't know, you know, I'm tired out, but I can't what, sleep. You read, you read one yeah. because it's, it's filling that yeah. space I had, again. I and... don't, don't want to go to sleep. And, of course, the doctor was quite understanding and he knew I knew what I was talking yeah. about. But I think you'd gone to that sense and, we, we, you know, I, I always sort of talk about this a lot and a um, big believer in it of you have to go to the floor to come back up oh, again. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah, and definitely, And when you yeah. start to be, you know, and you were so grateful. Oh, yeah. You were so grateful to be alive. You were yeah. so thankful yeah. to the doctors mm. that at that point nothing mm. mattered. No, no. Because all that you cared about yeah. We're seeing Eva May, that's seeing right. Bobby. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And just yeah. living. Yeah, that's right. And it was, it, it, I'm going to use this word, it was delicious to see. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, it was only not very, probably a month after. And I thought, I'm going to have to look into all what went off because I can't, uh, it, this doesn't make any sense to me. And you're talking about what went off with the charity With the charity commission. commission. So I started off with ringing up about this £900 bill for this free meeting. <laughs> and the solicitor said, well, when was this free meeting? <laughs> when was this meeting? And I said, well, 29th of November 2016. Oh, I was in Cardiff that day, he said. So I said to him, I said, well, I said, golly, if it's £900 for a meeting that you didn't attend, <laughs> how much would you charge if you'd been there, you know? <laughs> anyway, that's a, just a funny story, I think. It just makes me laugh. But uh, I started to look into everything, and luckily a friend had recorded all the episodes of, of all the, you know, the TV things that had been said about me on that day, all my interviews and so on. And I started to listen to them, and I said, well, that's such a load of rubbish. That's nonsense. How can they say that? So I put a complaint in to the, uh, to the TV channel. Um, they managed to lose three data sticks that were in envelopes that they signed for. But anyway, that's another story. But eventually I hand-delivered the fourth. And uh, it, it, I didn't get anywhere with complaining to the to the TV company. So they said, well, really, all they'd done was reported on what the Charity Commission had said. So now it's time to go to the Charity Commission and start complaining to them, which I did. I put a big complaint in to them. I got all the evidence of what's on the internet, the massive amount of stuff and it, that is still there about me on the internet. Not nice. Not nice. I mean, I was awarded an MBE in 2013, but if you put Wendy Watson MBE, all you get is this horrible stuff. Uh, horrible stuff. So, you know, not nice. And uh, getting that removed is, is, is so difficult. You, you, you sometimes <laughs> wonder, it's like, what, how, how can someone achieve all of this? Change genetic servicing, change European, you know, go to European Parliament, do all that, do all of this amazing stuff. And it gets buried. And it gets buried by one piece, by one piece of. Piece of Information that's, that's very wrong. dubious. <laughs> yes. Beyond yeah. yes, well, I would say it's definitely wrong. But uh, I'm, I'm with the Parliamentary Ombudsman, which we'll get to in a minute. So, uh, anyway, the interesting thing now. So, I put my complaint into the uh, Charity Commission and they didn't uphold it and said I could go to second stage complaint. So, I go to second stage complaint and they said that they'd followed the correct procedures in doing first stage complaint. The next stage is to go to the Parliamentary Ombudsman. So, and another thing that I suddenly thought of, I thought, you know, I've never seen these minutes that they keep quoting. I've never seen them. So I had written to John Pittman and I said, can you remember, you know, did you? No, I didn't get them either. Eventually, it turns out that they didn't actually send the minutes. So I said, well, have you got the notes from which? We have got them now, two and a half years later. So I said, well, have you got the notes from which you will have derived these minutes? Uh, and they said, no, we haven't got those. But they sent me the minutes through. Well, I've got my own notes, which I luckily kept from that uh, October the 18th meeting. And there was a semblance of truth in some of the bits, but a lot of it was so far out. I thought, well, this is just rubbish. This is nonsense. So I then started on FOI and SAR requests through the Charity Commission and got another bundle of 
thousands of pieces of paper. So I don't know if they've had time to deal with anybody else, really. When you look at all the emails they've had internally between themselves about, about me. You. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I couldn't, I've never printed it all off. You couldn't. It's folders and folders worth sent in zip files. I mean, one zip file didn't come, and so she sent it me by post, and it is that thick. That thick. And it's just all... It's all... Well, it's garbage, to be honest. I mean, it is garbage. You know, there's one thing that's particularly... Which, which makes me laugh when I think about it, because I can't think how they could be so... I've got to say incompetent, as to even think that this could be possible, is that um, they'd got it down that I'd... Uh, been paid £99,000 between these two, these two years. Um, but it didn't go through HMRC because I wasn't paid the usual way. Because I'd got a, incidentally, I'd got a letter from HMRC that proved that I didn't get paid these amounts that they were accusing me of in the FOI requests. So I got a letter from HMRC which proved it and they put, oh yes, but th th she didn't get paid the usual way. Well, I'll tell you what that £99,000 was. When we first set the charity up, we used to sell handbags and jewellery, makeup, wigs, a lot of wigs and things like yeah. that, nail varnishes and things. And I used to go on a Sunday morning and buy this stuff for the charity shops and then it would go through the accountant and it would be transferred into my account. Right, so it was you getting the money back that for I'd what spent, spent up front, up front, right? Yeah, okay. for the charity to sell in its shops, perfectly legal. And you'd done it all the way through the accountants; it was all there uh, to yeah, be seen. Absolutely, through the VAT invoices mm. and everything, the whole thing. So all the spreadsheets are there. I mean, but they'd put, well, she didn't get paid the usual way. Well, <laughs> oh, that wasn't being paid; that was that reimbursement was of of, of, ex, of expenses. Yeah. But, it's... you know, we, so they're completely up the wrong tree with that for a start. Mm. Um, on the, uh, uh, and it's on the internet, uh, Michelle Russell saying uh, that, uh, that I, they'd been to see me in, um, you know, the Charity Commission had been out to see me because they were a bit bothered about, the, we weren't earning a lot of money, apparently. Then she contradicts herself by saying it can be taking two to three, four, five years before a charity makes any money. But anyway, they decided to come out and see me uh, after year two. And um, that uh, we discovered, we investigated and discovered that she was being paid and then told, then uh, we told her that this had got to stop. But when we went back in October, it was still continuing. Hang on a minute. Hold on, I hadn't been paid for ages before then I'd had my P45 what are you talking about woman you know this is me saying to myself what on earth's going on here and uh, I, it was just phenomenal that they could even put that down because I hadn't been paid I'd had, a, I'd had my P45 the previous April that's just nonsense okay. so then I end up with the parliamentary ombudsman because I'm not leaving it at that mm -hmm. why would I give up you know they very glibly say oh well you can go to the parliamentary ombudsman knowing full well that they can't do anything but the parliamentary ombudsman don't have as many powers as they'd like to have but what they can look at is whether the um, whether the government body or whoever it is has used the correct procedures well obviously they haven't because they didn't circulate the minutes that they eventually made up and sent them to you two and a half years two later. and a half years later after all the damage had been done after the warning had been issued if they had circulated those minutes as they were then that would have been put right because i was at the meeting so they would have had to have circulated them to me and I would have been able to have addressed their in, in, inconsistencies. And you'd have been able uh, to and, see it. And, it, it, you know, it would have... Because mm. what they'd put, they didn't put down that we'd said, that John Pittman had said, we've got a meeting to discuss Wendy's role. They put down that we've told them that they, before they um, employ Wendy again, they're going to have to ask permission from us. Well, that it wasn't said at all. That's mm. nonsense. So it's all... It, it, it it's, is absolute and utter rubbish. Luckily, the Ombudsman can look into the fact that they didn't use the correct procedures. So I am now with the Ombudsman as we speak. And that's where it's... And at. this is where we are. 
And my plan is that when this is over, whatever happens, and I can't believe that they can't rule in my favour because they didn't use the right procedures. And look, the point of the matter is as well, is that that one thing had this instrumental effect that even left you at one point not wanting to be here anymore. It, it, it's cost the charity what, millions. Millions. And millions. In We've that been... respect, it has probably cost a lot of lives. And not just that, it's, it, it, it's been horrific. But can we just end on a positive? Because I yeah. really want us to. Yeah. And that you will win with this. I, I will. This. There's no doubt in. And I am going to not just leave it at that because I don't want anybody else to have to go through this. The yeah. ombudsman needs to have enough teeth to be able to go into everything. You know, not have to dodge round and weave and duck yeah. and dive over what they can do and what they can't. They need to be able to do it properly. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, the, you know, and there's another thing. You know what? In English law, you're actually innocent till you're proven guilty. But I'm having to prove my innocence. I'm having to do it all the other way no round. Wrong. That's blooming wrong, that is. is. Especially after everything that we've discussed and everything yeah. that we've talked about yeah. and all of those achievements, to then have that. Yeah. So it is, it, it is horrific. So, and I'm so glad that we've done these interviews. Yeah. I'm so glad that we've explored this. And I'm hoping so much that people really invest in, in every episode that, that we film together because I think it's so important. And I really want to end on a positive that oh, congratulations yeah. on 25 years <laughs> yeah, of the Helpline. 25 years. Yeah. So, you know, of course, we've got the charity ball coming up. Yes. 13th of November. Yes. We've got some amazing people coming out for it. We've got the charity single coming out yes, as well. Yes, charity single. Wow. Yeah, I know. Three generations alive, Mum. <laughs> Three of females because of what... Amazing. And so many more lives saved because of that. Well, so well done. Let's get his to the next 25, yeah? Absolutely. I don't know who's going to be running it, but... <laughs> Even me. We'll put her on We'll get her doing it. But yes, it's it's all going to be positive. It it's, there's no doubt in that. There it's no got doubt to be. in the end, it all comes to life. If you can actually get through all those things over the last few years and you're still here yeah. and you can still have a smile on your face... Well, blow them. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Here's to the next 25. Thank you.